thrilled to be able to do that. I love to be able to speak uh, God's word anywhere I can. Um, I've grown to appreciate Chuck as over the years as we've uh, worked closely together in many different places and especially uh, together at Faulkner and I appreciate uh, you allowing him to do that good work there with Faulkner as well. Not long ago I read about a man who was sitting at home one evening. He was watching TV and there was a knock on the door and he answered the door and there was a six foot tall cockroach standing there. Well the cockroach just punched him right in the nose and ran off. Well, he thought, wow, that, that's wild. I've never seen a cockroach six feet tall. And next night, he's sitting in the living room watching TV, knock on the door. He opens the door, and there's a same six-foot cockroach. He jumps in the door, and he punches him in the nose. He takes his fingers, and he turns his fingers all around and breaks his fingers and kicks him in the shin and runs away. And the guy's kind of standing there like, I, I, I just can't believe what's going on. This, this, is, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. So the third night, he's sitting in his living room. You're ahead of me. Knock on the door, six foot tall, cockroach standing at the door. He has a knife in each hand. And he jumps in and he stabs him with both of the knives. And the man falls to the floor. The cockroach runs away. He crawls over to the phone and he dials 911. The ambulance picks him up and he gets to the hospital and the doctor says, tell me, what happened? He said, well, you're not going to believe what happened, but there was a six-foot cockroach and he came three nights in a row. And he punched me and he twisted my fingers and he kicked me in the shin and finally he stabbed me. He said, well, I've heard uh, through some of my colleagues that there is a nasty bug going around. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> you ever got caught by a joke you told and it's funny and you, you want to laugh? Uh, you ever feel like some days you're getting punched in the nose? Someday somebody got a hold of your finger, just twisting your finger till it hurts and brings you to the ground. Feel like somebody's kicked you in the shin? You ever feel like somebody just stabbed you in the heart or in the back? That seems to be something that we all feel, we all deal with uh, on a regular basis. It may not be something we deal with every single day, but one of the things that we deal with regularly, even as God's children, is the the pressure that we, get, that we get from the world and our society. And one of the things that happens to us is we become very discouraged. We become hurt physically, um, in pain, emotionally. And it affects us spiritually because it is this daily grind that kind of gets us. The hardships of life, the difficulty of life, the things that seem to cave in on us when... We think everything's going pretty good, and then all of a sudden it doesn't go so well. We're just minding our own business, sitting in the living room watching TV, and suddenly there it is. It's, it's right in our face. It's in our life. It's something that drags us down. If you'd like to turn with me to Psalm 34, we're going to begin in Psalm 34, and then we'll move from there through several psalms. And I have a few scriptures to read at the very beginning, and then... We'll just refer to them after that, but we're going to look at several scriptures as we look at uh, beginning in Psalm 34. One of the things that I recognize as I read through the Psalms is that there is a realism about the writing of David as he deals with the day-to-day -day struggle of hardships. Have you noticed that David, it seems is dealing with the, the difficulties of life and the hardships of life and things that are troubling him and things that hurt him. And he's dealing with all of those. And the Psalms kind of encapsulate a lot of that hurt and pain and helps us, I think, see how that, like David, we can overcome. We can move through those difficulties and those hardships on a regular basis. We can move 
through those difficult days. Psalm 34, verses 1 through 10 is where we'll begin. Psalm 34, 1 through 10. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O oh, fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Go all the way over to Psalm 62. Psalm 62, verses 5 through 8. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in Him at all times, O oh people, pour out your heart before Him, God is a refuge for us. Psalm 145. Now, if between 62 and 145, you could probably just almost pick out any of those psalms, and there's going to be something in there that's going to tell you something about what we're speaking about tonight. Psalm 145, 1 through 9. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. Psalm 147, near there, Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord. For it is good to sing praises for God, to, to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem, he gathers the outcasts of Israel, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars, he gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble, he casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving, make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds, he prepares rain for the earth, he makes grass grow on the hills, he gives the beasts their food, and to the young ravens their cry, that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. One of the first things I notice as I read through these psalms is that there is a reminder about who God is and a reminder for us to have a grateful spirit about us. The psalmist continually is trying not only to remind the readers but to remind himself about who God is. I don't know about you, but I believe that one of the, the human characteristics that I have that's probably characteristics of, of most people is that I am forgetful and need to be reminded. Not because I am up in years or because I have a disease, but that is just characteristic of a 
person, and that is that we just need to be reminded. That's, that's, I think that's why that when we read through the Psalms over and over, and just these that we've read tonight, there is that reminder to remember who God is. There's that reminder that will bring us confidence in our day-to-day -day activity. That reminder about who God is that even when the difficult times come, even when hardships are faced, that God is who He is and He doesn't change. God is this way. God is who He is. God's character is always going to be God's character. It doesn't change. He's always going to be as He's been described here in the Psalms. We need to be reminded about who God is and we need to be reminded to praise Him and glorify Him and give thanks to Him because He is the God to whom we turn and on whom we depend day in and day out. What is it about God that we see in these Psalms that we ought to remember? What is it that gives us confidence in our difficult days? What do we see here that will really drive it home that when difficult times come, there is only one place to turn? Well, one of the things that stands out, and you saw this, I'm sure, in our reading is that when we look at God, we see a God who is the God who cares. He's a God who is concerned about His people. He is a God who will always be concerned about His people. He's a God who will be faithful to His people. He's a God that loves His people. He's a God that is a, a God of care and concern. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, there's one phrase in that that says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's a verse I think that we need to remember. Because in a day when we experience the punch to the face or the punch in the gut or the, 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 the striking pain of, of betrayal or whatever it might be that we experience on that day, I need to remember that God says, I'll never leave you. And I'll never forsake you. First Peter 5, um, there is a statement there made in verses 6 and 7. And just a part of that statement, he says that I am going to be with you. Uh, he, he did not spare his own son, but delivered his son up to be a sacrifice for us so that we might cast all our cares upon him for he cares for you. That's a verse I need to remember, right? I need to remember that very statement, He cares for me. He cares for me even though I may be going through difficulty. He cares for me even though there may have been this traumatic experience on this day. Even though this day brought such news and such events that have been devastating to my heart and has destroyed my faith in man or humankind, and yet I need to remember that He cares for me. I need to remind myself, like the psalmist has done through these psalms we read, that God is always going to be there. He's always going to be the same God He's always been. And if He says, I care for you, He'll do it every single day of my life. In Romans chapter 8, there's a statement that's made that says about Him how He gave us all things. He didn't even spare His own Son. And He demonstrated that kind of love toward us, Romans chapter 5, in giving us His Son, even though we didn't deserve it. In the book of Exodus, you begin to see a people who, who ought to be reminded of, on a regular basis, who it is that they serve. As a matter of fact, the Israelites have seen the awesomeness of God. They've witnessed the very character of God on display, the power of God on display. They saw the plagues, those ten awesome miracles that God performed culminating in the death of the firstborn of all of the Egyptians. And I think just as miraculous and just as telling is the fact that the blood of the lamb on the doorpost caused that death not to enter into that household. And yet you see these children of Israel having witnessed that, that, uh, those series of miracles, those that we call the ten plagues. They move from there and there they're at the Red Sea and they have the Red Sea on one side and the Egyptian army on the other side and God parts the Red Sea and they walk across on dry ground and, 
Then he takes the army out by allowing the waters to come back together and destroy the Egyptian army. They make it to Mount Sinai, and there Moses goes up on the mountain. He visits with God for 40 days and comes down with this, this series of, of, of uh, commandments, the two tablets of stone, and then everything that you have collected there in the, in the book of the law that would, that would pertain to their, to their relationship with God. He desires relationship. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. And here are some things that you need to do to be my people. Yet, even though they witnessed all of that, I guess they forgot. I guess they didn't remember what had happened. I guess they just allowed it to, to disappear from their minds. Because it seems immediately in Exodus chapter 15, the people began to complain against Moses. In chapter, seven, uh, chapter 16, excuse me, the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. Chapter 16, verse 2. In chapter 17, verse 3, the people thirsted there for water and the people complained against Moses. They didn't stop and count their blessings. They didn't stop and think about the God that they serve. They didn't remind themselves about the character of the God that they serve and His promises. They didn't remind themselves that we've, we've witnessed the awesomeness and the power of this God that we are subject to, and as a result of that, they complained. They didn't think to remind themselves, as the psalmist did, that God is the one that heals the brokenhearted and binds up the wounds. They didn't remind themselves, as the psalmist reminds himself, he determined the number of stars and gave each one of them their name. They didn't remind themselves, like the psalmist did, that our Lord is mighty in power, that our Lord is beyond our ability to understand, beyond our limits. He sustains the humble. The Lord that I serve supplies the rain for the fields. He strengthens the bars of the gates of the city. He blesses the people. He grants peace. He grants food. He puts the grass on the hillside. All of that, if they had reminded themselves, I wonder, would they have complained? And the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in the wilderness. Numbers chapter 14. You're very familiar with the story of the spies that went into the land, and as they came from that land with the ten who said we can't, and with the two that said we can, and we need to, and we better, and God's with us, and let's go now, and the ten said, oh no, we can't. The people followed the instruction of the ten spies and they complained against Moses and Aaron and they turned against God and God dealt with them severely. I wonder if they had reminded themselves about the God that they serve. If they would just taken time to sit down and rehearse even with their children on their knees about the ten plagues about the crossing of the Red Sea, about the mighty mountain of Sinai where God dwelt on that time. Would it have been different? I think that some people have a propensity to grumble and complain. There was a grandmother who was walking by the ocean with her five-year-old grandson. She had him by the hand. The waves were rough and the waves were rolling in and he pulled away from her and dashed into the wave, wave and the wave just grabbed him and pulled him out into the ocean. Well, she hit her knees and she put her hands together and she said, Lord, please bring my grandson back. Well, the next wave came in, set the young man down right in front of her, right on his feet. She looked him over, she looked up to heaven and she said, Lord, when you took him, you had a hat on. 
I guess some people find anything to complain about, can't they? Well, I guess we can, if that's what we seek. But if my mind is focused on the God that I serve and who He is and the very fact that He cares for me, I'll have great confidence in my God even though the world around me seems to be falling apart. One of my favorite psalms we didn't go to, but uh, I think it would do us well to consider it, uh, not to go there right now, but to think about the very words of Psalm 46. Because the psalmist would say, My God is my refuge and my ever-present help in time of trouble. That is enough, isn't it? To understand that the God that I serve... In, in the days of my trouble, in the days of my sorrow, in the days of my pain, the God that I serve is a God who is able and He cares. I have confidence because the God that I serve is a mighty God. I have confidence in the day of, of difficulty, in the, in the day of hardship, when trouble comes, I have confidence because I know my God is greater than any of my troubles. If your troubles are bigger than your God, you do not serve the God of the Bible. If your troubles are too big for the God that you serve to handle, then you're serving the wrong God. Because the troubles that are abounding in the world that we live in are all smaller than the God of the Bible. Smaller than the God I serve. You remember from Psalm 145, it said very straightforwardly, Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness cannot be fathomed. The word fathom is an interesting word. It looks to be a, a measurement. You remember a fathom measuring the depth of some, some uh, water uh, source, some, some um, sea or some lake or whatever. It, it's a measure of something. You can't measure God's greatness. You just can't measure it. You just can't come to an understanding of God's greatness. Why, well, the book of Isaiah would say that man's input into what God has done, even the greatest kingdoms of the world, are like a drop in the bucket compared to God. It is minuscule, it is so small, it is so little, it is such a small contribution because the greatness of God is beyond my ability as a human being to comprehend. I can't fathom it. I think that we tend to want to put God in human form so we can better understand Him. We tend to want to, want to see Him in, in some kind of human shape or human form or with some kind of human characteristics. And By the way, the Bible does talk about God front with having human characteristics, hands and ears and, and that kind of thing, His feet and so forth. But really, when you think about God and try to bring Him down to the human understanding, we're trying to limit Him. And we're used to things being limited. We're used to, as human beings, being limited because we are. We are limited in our time. We're limited in our abilities. We're limited in our strength. We are limited in our patience. We are limited in our resources. We are limited in our understanding of the situation. We are limited. That's why when you reach the end of the rope, you tie a knot, right? No. When you reach the end of your rope, then you recognize you've done all you can do, and now it's all in God's hands. Because He is limitless. He has no boundaries like human beings do. He has no, he has no end. He has no beginning. There is nothing he cannot do. Uh, unfortunately, I've been relegated the responsibility of singing VBS songs a lot of times from Vacation Bible School. But one of the best songs you can sing at VBS is, My God is so strong and mighty. That's the idea. My God is so mighty. In 18... 75. As a matter of fact, on July 4th, 1875, there, were, there was a crew 
that went to Lake Tahoe and measured the depth for the first time of Lake Tahoe in the deepest point, supposedly 1,465 feet deep in one place. Now, it's, I think, the fifth or sixth or seventh, I don't remember, deepest lake in the world. But the idea of 1,465 feet deep, um, that is beyond my limit. Uh, I can hold my breath for about 36 seconds, and after that, it's over. My God is limitless. There is no depth, there is no height, there is no width, there is no strength, there is no time, there is no money, there is no patience, there is no insider understanding that is not within his power. He is mighty. What do you do when troubles come? What do you do when hard times come? Are before you? What do you do when hardships are tough and mean and nasty? What do you do? We rely on a God that is mighty. But there's something else that these Psalms describe about the God that I serve, and that is there's a lot said there about the God who is gracious. The idea of God being gracious is spoken of several times through those psalms. Psalm 145 as well as Psalm 147 both speak of that graciousness. In spite of all of the wrong that I've done, in spite of all of the, the sin that I've committed, in spite of all of the the bad attitude and the negativism and the complaining and the, and the turning my back on God, Jesus still died for my sins. The graciousness of God is extended beyond that initial forgiveness of sins, though. The graciousness of God is extended even further because the, the understanding that God has about His creation, humanity, is that we will not remain perfect. When we are buried with Him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life, we are raised from that watery grave of baptism, righteous and pure and clean and holy, and now we've got to live a holy life. Man, that's hard. It's not an easy task day after day to live the way we know we ought to live. Praise God for His graciousness. I find that more applicable when the hardship that I experience is my own fault. Been there, haven't we? The hardship that I experience as a result of my poor choices, my, the choice of the poor, the, the, the friends that I've chosen or, or the, the thing I've chosen to do with my money or something else, something that, that I have chosen to do. And I know that God looks down and shakes his head and says, I knew it was coming, but I still can't believe you did it. He's a God of graciousness, a God that is filled with grace, a God who, who gives us what we do not deserve, and as a matter of fact, His mercy is extended to that when we don't get what we really deserve, which is condemnation. He is a God full of graciousness. Now, how do I, how do I respond to that graciousness? How do I respond? Well, of course, one of the things that the psalmist would talk about would be that I follow him, I do his will, I am, I am committed to be his man or be his woman and do his will to the very best of my ability. I obey him. What do I do? I obey him. The psalmist describes the fact that I serve him. The word is used in the original Hebrew language a couple of times through those psalms that we read, and that is that I serve him and I give my life to him and I 
and I worship Him, and I praise Him, and I extol His name to others. I really got on the Israelites a while ago for their grumbling and complaining and for their bad attitude. With all the benefit they had of being able to witness the power and the might and the strength of God, and yet they didn't remember. If I remember God's graciousness, I don't think I can keep it in. If I remember who He is and what He's done for me and the fact that I didn't deserve it and even though I was a sinner and I was His enemy and I was against Him and I was speaking ill of Him and I was working against Him, even though that was true, He still extended His grace to me. If I really believe that and understand that, I don't think I can keep it a secret. But one of the things that the psalmists say about God also is that when I'm going through difficult times and when hardships arise, that I need to remember that God is faithful. God is faithful. In addition to His power, in addition to the fact that He is mighty, in addition to the fact that He is gracious, In addition to the fact that I look at God and one of the things I see is a God who is uh, to be praised and glorified, but I remember that He is a God who is faithful. The steps of the godly are directed by the Lord. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will not fall, for the Lord holds them by their hand. Psalm 37. Psalm 94, when I said, my foot is slipping, your love, O Lord, supported me. And again, uh, there's those words from Psalm uh, 46. Uh, He is my refuge. He is an ever-present help in time of trouble. God remains stable. God remains in control. God remains steady. God does not waver. God is immovable. God is unchanging. He is faithful. I turned to the Lord, we read from Psalm 62, and one of the things that the psalmist said there is, I turned to the Lord for salvation. He said, I turned to the Lord for security. I turned to the Lord for my strength. The Lord does not change. Therefore, I turn to Him because I have great confidence in Him. Lastly, I can have confidence even though I'm going through difficult times In knowing that the Lord is near. The Lord is near. I stood at a hospital bed today as a man passed from this life to another. You don't do many things more difficult than that. As a minister or as a family member or as a friend... It's a difficult situation. Comfort comes by knowing God is near. When my heart is broken, when my path is unclear, when my life seems to be in deep trouble, the Lord is near. You remember when Elijah ran? Elijah was scared. Elijah hit a real tough spot in his life. He was working hard for God, and all of a sudden things turned and it seemed everything was against him. He would trusted God, and it seemed God failed him, so he ran, and he found a dark cave. He got in the dark cave, and the word from the Lord came and said, Elijah, why are you here? He didn't say, why are you over there? He said, why are you here? Because God said, I'm here with you. In the darkness, God is near. In the light, God is near. In the faraway places, God is near. In the trouble of life, in the difficulty of of life, God is near. He's near to those who seek Him. He's near to those who remember His truth. 
He is near to those who love Him and those who, who seek to be His people. Though the wicked will not be near Him, though the wicked will be destroyed, according to Psalm 145, verse 20, and a couple of other verses that we read in the Psalms, God is near to those who call upon Him. God is near. God's hand is open. God's hand is beckoning. God, God's hand is pleading. God's hand is offering His assistance. There was a young boy who started to kindergarten, and all of the kids were given a task to perform. That task was a very simple task, and that was to draw something and to color it that had some meaning about their first day of kindergarten. The teacher would hold up the picture, and she would let the students then comment about what they saw in that picture. What, what do you see? And one was a picture of a rainbow, and one student said, Oh, that's a beautiful rainbow, and I saw one of those the other day, and it means that the rain is over and God's uh, shining his, uh, not smiling upon us, I think was the way it was put. There's another one of a flower and the little girl had drawn this beautiful flower with the yellow petals and the green inside and a green stem and the sun shining, a beautiful little, little picture. She got to one, one final picture and it was a picture of just a hand, just an open hand. And the students all commented, and they all really got excited about the open hand and uh, what all that meant. And, and uh, the little boy that was over there who had drawn the picture didn't even get to comment. And the teacher, uh, the bell rang, and the teacher sent the kids on to their next uh, um, activity. And I think it was actually recess or something, and so they all left. And the little boy's kind of lagging behind, and she called him back, and she said, uh, you drew this picture, didn't you? And he said, yes. And she said, uh, tell me about this picture. Is it, is it God's hand? Is it, is it the hand of, of, uh, of giving that's giving to the, to the world, or giving food to the world? And a lot of deep things were brought up. Tell me what this hand is. He said, no, teacher, it's your hand. It's a hand that gives, it's a hand that supports, it's a hand that demonstrates love. He said, because my very first day of school, you put your hand around my shoulder and you helped me get into the classroom. Here it is, my very first day of school, and I'm, I'm new in town, I don't have any friends, I don't know anybody. You took me by the hand and you guided me right into the classroom and you showed everybody how much you loved me and cared for me. When I needed a pencil, it was your hand who handed me that pencil. It was your hand that rubbed the top of my head when I did good on my work. It was your hand that demonstrated to me that you cared about me. God doesn't physically use his hand in that way. But the psalmist understood as I think we need to do as well, that the Lord's hand is near and it supports us in our time of trouble. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse nor his delight in the legs of man, but his pleasure is in those who fear him and put their hope in his unfailing love. Psalm 147, 10 and 11. Let's pray together. Our Holy Father, we're very grateful that you blessed us with uh, the privilege to be able to be your children. And Father, for the great privilege it is to be able to know who you are and to have confidence in you. And though it seems the world around us is uh, falling apart, you are our strength, you are our refuge and a very present help in time of trouble. We know, Father, that we are to be reminded of who you are, to remember your power and strength and your graciousness, to remember you care for us, and to remember that you are near no matter what.
the world might think or what may be happening around us, you are near to us. Father, we're grateful for this church. We thank you for this series. We thank you for their good work, not only in the community, but throughout the world. We thank you for their elders. We thank you for their ministers. And Father, we thank you for each member, and we pray for every member here that we would be reminded of where we need to turn in time of trouble. And Father, we thank you for your Son who showed us what it looks like to turn to you though our life be turned upside down. We thank you for him. We thank you for his sacrifice, and it's through him that we pray. Amen.